Welcome, everybody, to another episode of the Communication Lecture Series. I am your host, Adam Banks, and on this episode, we are going to be discussing the introduction to public speaking. The benefits of a public speaking course. I get asked this question all the time. Why do I need to take speech? I'm not going to have to speak at my job. I'm going to be sitting at a desk working on a computer all day long. So why do I need this? Well, I'm going to tell you the benefits of taking a public speaking course. Many college graduates, they look back on all the courses that they've taken. Their math courses, their science courses, their history courses. And a lot of them will say that public speaking was one of the courses that they value the most. And I'm going to give you some reasons of why public speaking course, effective public speaking, is going to be one of the most valuable courses you ever take in college. One reason is you learn how to speak to a public audience. Knowing how to stand up and give a talk to a group of people is a very rewarding skill, and you can use this throughout your entire life. Imagine yourself in certain public speaking scenarios. For instance, um, you might have to be talking at a bank. You might have to talk at a job interview. You might have to give a presentation at your job. Think about being in court and having to explain to the court uh, why that you uh, got into this traffic violation. Why, and you have to defend yourself out of a a ticket. Reason number two is you learn skills that apply to one-on-one communication. Now, Most of the time, public speaking courses focus on talking to groups, but you can also take those skills that you learn by talking to groups and apply that to individual communication. Let me give you an example. You're at a job interview, and the hiring manager says, we've got 50 well-qualified applicants for this job. Why should we hire you? Bingo, you are going to have to give a solid answer to that question. In a public speaking course, you are going to learn how to organize and present persuasive messages. Let's say another scenario is that you are at a bank and you are talking to the banker about taking out a loan for a home. Well, the nonverbal communication skills such as you know your eye contact, your facial expressions, Those things that you learn in a public speaking course should help you convey to the banker that you are a trustworthy and reliable person who will repay that loan. Reason number three is you develop the oral communication skills that are prized in the job market. Research shows that oral communication skills is the prized value skill that a lot of employers love in their employees. And not to mention, once you snag that job and you secure that job for yourself, those oral communication skills is what's going to help you get promotions in your job. The fourth reason is you work in an ideal environment for getting experience and building confidence. When you're in a public speaking course, like the ones that I teach, that is the ideal environment for you to learn because we're all family here. We all are going through the same thing. We're all nervous. We all are going to make mistakes because we're all new in a public speaking course. All of my students are, lack of a better word, amateurs in speaking when they first start out. So they understand and they sympathize with you as you're giving a speech. And it is the perfect place to learn what you need help on. For instance, if you say, um, 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 uh, 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 every other word, and it's, you say it so much that it becomes distracting to your audience, it's good for you to learn in your public speaking course because you're going to hear it from the feedback that you get from me as your instructor, or you're going to hear it back from your fellow classmates, and it's a good way for you to learn from that. Most students at the end of their public speaking course, they gain so much confidence. It amazes me, and it's one of the best things that I love about my job is what a student is like when they first walk into my class and how they are when they leave, of how much more self-confident they are. The fifth reason is 
you can make a contribution to the lives of other people. You can speak at formal events. You can really influ- um, influence people through speaking. Um, motivational speakers, for instance, are people who influence others. Um, you can influence people at a funeral if you're asked to give a eulogy. You can influence people at a wedding if you're asked to give a speech at a friend or a family member's wedding. Words are powerful, and you can really impact people through your words. And a, spub- uh, and a public speaking course is going to help you with that. So that's some benefits of a public speaking course. Let's talk about the speech communication process. The first thing you need to learn before we talk about the communication process is speaking and communicating are different. I am speaking to you right now, but am I communicating to you? Let me give you an example of what I mean by that. And because if you can speak to a listener and the listener does not understand your message the way you meant it to be understood, you have failed at communicating your message. Uh, let me give you an example. Um, a job recruiter coached a, a young lady uh, of how to present herself at a job interview. And the uh, job recruiter says, okay, when you go to your interview, wear your best, dress your best. So on the day of the interview, the woman shows up in a prom dress. <laughs> the recruiter had meant to wear your best business attire. That's what she meant to say. But the young woman had interpreted the advice as wear the fanciest clothes you own. So the job recruiter failed at communicating with her listener. She spoke, but communication didn't take place. A speaker can give information all day long, but true effective communication fails to take place at the listener misinterprets your message. To, to fully understand this and to fully make sure that you do communicate while you are speaking, you need to understand the elements of the communication process. There are seven distinct components to the communication process. The first element of the communication process is the speaker. In this situation, I am the speaker. And being the speaker, you have a great deal of responsibility because you constantly have to keep asking yourself, am I getting through to my listeners? Are they understanding what I am trying to communicate to them? The second element of the communication process is the listener. The listener is the receiver of the speaker's message. That's your audience, the recipient, you could say. You as a listener... You also share, maybe even equally, the same responsibility as a speaker because you it is your job to dissect what the speaker is saying and try to make sense of your speaker. So you have to do everything you can to avoid the temptation to daydream or to uh, let your mind wander. You must listen with an open mind and listen to everything that your speaker is saying. Because what happens if you just judge your speaker on what they're saying just because you don't agree with it, that's going to get in the way of your listening. The third element of the communication process is the message. And the message is whatever is communicated verbally and non-verbally to the listener. The message can be sent in the form of a verbal way of communicating or a non-verbal way of communicating. Verbal symbols are words. The fourth element of the communication process is channel. And the channel is the medium used to communicate the message. A speech can reach an audience by a variety of different ways. Uh, Through your voice, it could be reached through the medium of television, through radio, through the internet, through um, a magazine or a newspaper. It's just however your message is being transmitted. That is the fourth element, is the channel. And that is basically the pathway used to transmit your message, how you're getting your message across to your audience. The fifth element is feedback. And feedback is the uh, response 
that the listeners give the speaker. And the feedback can sometimes be verbal or nonverbal. Uh, for instance, um, you know, verbally, it would be, you know, just at the end of your speech, you would get um, questions from your audience. Uh, a nonverbal uh, feedback would be uh, what your audience is doing nonverbally, like yawning. If you got people in your audience yawning, they say that yawning is a silent scream, that you are being very boring and what you're saying isn't very interesting. Um, another nonverbal is uh, you can look at your audience and you can tell uh, certain things about, they're giving you feedback nonverbally, whether they're, you know, smiling, they could be smiling at you, they could be nodding their head, um, they could be crossing their arms. You can tell a lot from your audience by just looking at your audience and paying attention to the nonverbal signs that they give you. You can get a lot of feedback that way. The sixth element in the communication process is interference. And interference is anything that obstructs the accurate communication of the message. So that is anything that blocks or hinders the accurate communication of what you are trying to say. There are three types of interference. The first type is external interference. And external interference is out of the listener's control. Things that are happening that are uh, things that you cannot control. For instance, coughing, um, a baby crying, people talking out loud in the hallway, um, an air conditioner that is just extremely loud and annoying. Um, the room that you're sitting in when you're listening to a speech is very hot, and in return it just makes you feel very uncomfortable, and you're so focused on how uncomfortable and hot you are that you're not really listening entirely to your speaker. That is an external interference. The second type of interference is internal interference, and that comes from within the listener. That's where the daydreaming comes in. Uh, you're just listening to your speaker and then all of a sudden your mind just starts to wander and you start daydreaming about what you're going to do when you get out of class or what you're going to do when you uh, get out of the meeting that you're in or you start thinking about what you're going to have for dinner or you start thinking about a problem that's going on in your life because we all got things that are going on outside of our lives. We're all busy. We all have jobs. We all got things going on outside of our lives other than school. And that's, that's really hard to um, block things out of our mind sometimes when somebody's talking. And that is an interference, and that is the internal interference. Uh, the third interference is called speaker generated interference. And that occurs when the speaker uses words that are unfamiliar to the audience. Um, I, for instance, doctors do this all the time. That's when, like, have you ever had a doctor come in and they just start using words that you just totally confuses you and you're like, can you please speak in layman terms? And they're using just medical jargon. That's an interference in getting in your way of understanding their message. Or if the speaker wears bizarre clothing, like a big bright orange suit, your audience is going to be focused more on that big bright orange suit than what your actual message is. The seventh and final element of the speech communication process is situation. And the situation is the setting in which the communication takes place. It is the context, the time, and the place in which the communication occurs. Different situations, they call for different behaviors by both the speaker and the listener. At any speaking engagement, your setting is going to be different. The way you talk at a funeral is going to be different in the way you talk at a wedding reception. A funeral, sometimes joking isn't really appropriate or clapping or laughing isn't so appropriate than what it would be at a wedding or what it would be at a comedy club if you're up get, telling jokes. It's all about the situation you're in, and you need to really tailor your speech with the appropriate setting that your speech is taking place in. The time of day plays a huge part in how receptive 
your audience is. A study say that uh, 3 p.m. to 5 p.m., uh, a lot of people around that time seem to be very sluggish and uh, sleepy during that time of the day. So that's when you know that if you're speaking from 3 to 5 p.m., you need to be very lively. You need to show colorful visual aids. You need to tailor it to the time of day you're speaking at. If your speech is going to be a long speech, you might want to invite your listeners to stand up, stretch, you know, get up, uh, move around for a little bit at, the, at a halfway point at your speech. When you prepare for your speech, it's just important to find, to find out as much as possible about your situation. Where your speech is going to be given, is it going to be indoors, is it going to be outdoors? You know, what is the uh, nature of your speech? How many people are likely to be uh, present at your speech? Because this is going to let you know if uh, you're going to have to, if you can be more conversational with your audience, if it's a smaller audience. Um, it's just good to know your situation as much as possible. Now, you as a speaker have some responsibility. You have three main responsibilities. Um, your first responsibility as a speaker is the never distort responsibility. You should always be honest about the facts and the figures that you give. Not only is it dishonest, but it's just foolish. And if somebody in your audience knows that you are lying, they could expose you for that. And then you're just going to get a reputation that you are not a credible speaker because you distort information. So at all cost and by all means, tell the truth. You will be deemed a liar. And even if you are telling the truth, they're going to still think you're a liar. The second responsibility that you have is to respect your audience. Do not disrespect your audience. Never talk down to your audience. Always speak with a polite tone and don't treat your audience like a bunch of idiots because we all are ignorant in certain situations. There is a quote that I love, and the quote is by Will Rogers. He said, there is nothing as stupid as an educated man if you get him off the thing he was educated in. And the third and final responsibility is to reject stereotyping and scapegoating. Don't just get up and assume that just because you're giving a speech on how to change a tire on a car that women don't know what you're talking about because most men are the ones that work on cars more than women. You're stereotyping. Don't get up and say that all lawyers are bad because not all lawyers are bad. Majority of the lawyers can be dishonest, but not all of them are dishonest. So avoid that. Stereotype is an oversimplified or an exaggerated image. And a scapegoat is an individual or a group that, in that innocently bears the blame of others. Uh, for instance, um, Mexican families are known to always hang around their families and to have a lot of their family members um, around them at all at all times. That's what you know. That's a that's kind of a scapegoat, but. Just because that's a scapegoat doesn't mean that every single Mexican that lives in the world is like that. So don't just assume and say things in your speech that scapegoats or stereotypes a certain group. You need to take every speech seriously. You need to take classroom speeches seriously. And you need to take speeches that have small audiences seriously. Because a classroom speech... The ones that we do in my public speaking courses, that's where you learn the most about public speaking. That's where you learn your flaws. That's where you learn your strengths. Don't take a speech for granted if you're speaking in front of a small audience because those sometimes can be the hardest speeches to give because that's when your audience is really paying attention to you because it's just it feels more private. It feels more personable when you're in there with a smaller audience. And you never know if you're in there with 10 people and you have an audience of 10, you never know who those 10 people can be. 
All right, ladies and gentlemen, that about wraps it up for this edition of the communication lecture series. If you have any questions or you want to drop a line to the communication lecture series, you want to ask us something, you want to comment on something, follow us on Facebook at facebook.com slash communication lecture series. Subscribe to us on the YouTube channel at communication lecture series. And also you could email your question, thoughts, comments at communication lecture series at gmail.com. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm your host, Adam Banks. I'll see you in the next episode of the Communication Lecture Series. Makes you a world class speaker. This a complete system ain't nothing easier. I used to be shy, never had a clue.